<clears throat> I'd like to tell you a story. Uh, it's about a little boy who grew up in Sweden in the 60s and 70s. <clears throat> his dad was this tall, good-looking army officer. His mom was this uh, pretty but shy linguist. He had a brother and two sisters, and they lived in a suburb of Stockholm. <clears throat> and that little boy was me. I think I remember the first time my dad hit me. I was around three or four, I think, and he, I was walking in front of the TV, and he kicked me, and I flew into some bookshelves. And I remember there was blood, and my mom was screaming. You see, my dad had a lot of problems, and he took it out on me and my mom, never touched my brothers or sisters. And this started when I was about three or four, and went on until I was about 11 or 12. It was a really hard part of my life because I had to go to school with a black eye or, you know, some of my hair was missing when he'd been yanking my head. <clears throat> I think some of you may know what I'm talking about. I understand how you're feeling. You see, when you get abused at home, you have two choices. It's like an animal, fight or flight. You can either run away which was impossible for me because I was a little kid living at home. Or you could fight back, which I couldn't do because, you know, I was just a little kid and my dad was my size. <clears throat> but I've learned later there's a third choice. You freeze. It's like a gazelle being taken by a lion. You just freeze and go dead. All your emotions are bottled up inside. I would just lay there when he was hitting me. I wouldn't even cry. And by the time I was 11 or 12, I was smoking, I was drinking, I was running away from home on stolen motorcycles, sleeping over in somebody's garage. But my dad always found me back home for another beating. So my grades at school were terrible. And uh, my dad said, I got to do something. I got to get rid of this kid somehow and get him out of here. So he decided to send me up north to his parents, my grandparents. And they lived in a small town in the northern part of Sweden. Now, Sweden is a country pretty far north. I mean, Stockholm in the winter gets dark at 2.30 p.m. Stockholm was like Miami Beach compared to the place <laughs> I was being sent. But my grandparents were quite nice to me, and they took care of me, and my grades got better. I discovered ice hockey and then weight training and karate, and I started to heal. And by the time I was about 17 or 18, I remember something my dad had told me. Because, you know, my dad was actually a pretty smart guy. He was very charming. He was a nice guy. <clears throat> Most of the time, when he wasn't going nuts. And uh, he told me, listen, listen, kid, this socialistic country, forget it. You can't do anything here. If you want to be somebody, you've got to go to America. And I always remember that. So I kind of got all the scholarships I could because I didn't have any money. I got a scholarship to WSU, Washington State University. Another one to Clemson. Finally, I got a Fulbright scholarship to MIT, which is the reason I'm standing here. And there was just one little snag. I, because my fourth year, uh, it's my last year as a master's, I was in Sydney at the University of Sydney and uh, studying engineering on a scholarship. <clears throat> and I was working extra as a bouncer because, you know, that trauma is really helpful when you get in the ring with somebody. <laughs> so I became a pretty good fighter. I was a karate champion, and I had what you call a killer instinct. Um, so me and my buddy, who was my sparring partner, we got hired to do some special work at a rock concert, different artists. And one of them was this beautiful black singer, statuesque, lady named Grace Jones. And we worked there, and then afterwards she hired some of us to do special security at her party when she was going to go out and hang out at the nightclubs in Sydney. I didn't really realize right away why she picked this tall, blonde, buffed guy to be her special security. But, uh, you know, I found out later that evening. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I ended up in her hotel room Missed a few classes the next day, college. And, you know, 
and she was a world-class artist, totally out of my league. That's what I thought. That she didn't agree, you know. So we ended up having this relationship. I went to Tokyo to do some karate. She was there doing a commercial. Then I ended up moving to New York. So I had a couple of months before I was going to start MIT. And those months literally changed my life. Because what happened was, this is New York City, Studio 54. I met David Bowie, Michael Jackson. First week I was there, I went to some party. There was a little guy with white hair. Came up to me and said, hi, what are you famous for? Took a picture of me. I'm like, nothing as far as I know. He goes, hey, I'm going to put you in my magazine. Well, it was Andy Warhol, Interview Magazine. So um, finally, when it was time to go back to school, to Cambridge, MIT, <sighs> chemical engineering just didn't seem as exciting <laughs> somehow. <laughs> so, but anyway, I got this, took this big black motorcycle I'd bought, 1200 cc, threw brace on the back, all decked out of leather. I got in my leather pants, didn't wear a shirt too often in those days, uh, drove up to Cambridge. <laughs> And I think the professors at MIT had a slightly different idea of who this Swedish star <laughs> student was. So when this thing just went past the window, and I think they were sort of shocked, you know, they expected somebody else, slightly smaller maybe with some Coke bottle glasses or something. But anyway, they were as shocked as I was not belonging there. I felt it right away. Three weeks later, I was gone. Went back to New York. Got an agent, saw all other actors, started studying, acting, got up for a couple of movies. One was a boxing movie. Turned out to be Rocky IV, and I auditioned for it. Finally, I got the role, moved out here. I was training with Sly Stallone down here, about a mile away from here. Uh, and the film was shot and opened 30 years ago, Memorial Day. And I came out of the theater with Grace, and people were taking pictures of me. I'm like, what happened? Oh, I guess I'm a movie star. Okay, great. But, you know, the problem was this. My troubles had only started. Because what happened was that frozen part of me, remember that I told you, started coming out and kind of running my life. Because what happens is when you have this trauma, it's like a soldier with post-traumatic stress, you end up acting on something called escape behavior. You're trying to escape from something that you can't escape from because it's inside of you. Drinking sexual affairs, overeating, violence, you name it. I, I did a lot of bad things to myself. And 25 years later, 40 movies later, yeah, I was a movie star, but I was miserable most of the time. I had a failed marriage, two daughters who I loved, but they didn't even know me. My career was kind of rock bottom. This is only five years ago. And I didn't know how to get out of it. Two things happened. I got a call from my old buddy, Sly Stallone. Hey, Dolph, how you doing? <laughs> uh, uh, I got the script. So check it out, see what you think. Well, the script was called The Expendables. It was a big hit. I was back on the big screen after 15 years. The other thing is I met this girl, fell in love with her. And I knew I was going to embark on the same stupid path I'd been down before. Actually, something happened. Some girl was flirting with me. I gave her my number. The usual, the text, the pictures, she saw it. A few of you may have been there. She went nuts. We were about to break up. And I said, I can't do this. I've got to change my life somehow. She had told me before, why don't you try therapy? I'm like, forget about it. It's for sissies. <laughs> what about meditation? Ah, do I look like an Indian guru? I don't think so. <laughs> so, to make a long story short, I took up therapy three years ago, meditation, and it totally changed my life. Suddenly, this fog that I was living in lifted. I went, did the therapy where you go back in time, you re relive your experiences, you cry, scream, you roll up in a little ball, you hit the couch with a baseball bat, you know, anything you got to do to start to try to attack this part of you, this frozen part of me that was running my life, and slowly started to become smaller and smaller, and I can sort of see my life come back to me. And the meditation helped as well. So, the first thing I did, I, I went back to my, see my kids. And I asked them for forgiveness, what I had done, because I told them what happened with my dad. And I was a guy who didn't like what I had done, and they started crying right away. And I realized they had, had a lot of pain, and I cried with them. Did the same with my ex-wife and a few other people I'd hurt. And um, 
As a matter of fact, I also in my head forgave my dad for what he did and my mom for what she didn't do. And I started embarking on a new life. It was like a fight worth fighting to come to terms with yourself, to heal yourself. But what I didn't realize was there is another level to that. Because once you start healing yourself and feel better, you see other people around you who need help, who have pain. And faith kind of came to me, and I wrote and produced a movie about human trafficking called Skin Trade. And I learned about human trafficking, which is a terrible crime. There's 20 million slaves in the world today. It's a $20 billion industry, second largest in the world. These people are physically humiliated, psychologically abused, they have no self-worth, sort of like how I used to feel. And kind of fate brought me in contact with this, with human trafficking and, and these victims. When I came back to LA, I called an organization called CAST and asked them if I could help. Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. Well, I've been helping them ever since, and it's a great feeling for me to finally give something back. You know, and a lot of this human trafficking isn't just happening in like India and Africa and all over there. As a matter of fact, one of the most interesting cases was a girl who was brought over from a third world country by a very wealthy family. She was kept in the house, they took her passport, kept on the guard all the time, threatened her with violence, threatened her family. You know where the house was? In Brentwood, right here, about a mile from here. And she didn't know what to do. They brought this American nanny in to take care of the little kid, and they talked, and the American nanny said she was going to help her, but nothing happened. A week passed, a month passed. Finally, they were coming back from the park one day. She was taking care of this kid, and there was the security guy as usual. And there was 15 FBI agents outside the house. They took her inside and said, do you want to stay, do you want to leave? She said, I want to leave. Cass got her into a shelter, re-educated her, brought her back, learned a job. She got, finally ended up getting a green card. As a matter of fact, she met this man from her home country that she fell in love with, and, uh, and they got married. And to be part of something like that, it's just amazing. As a matter of fact, Alice, she is also pregnant with her new baby, and I thought her towards the end of my talk, I want you to say hi to her, Alice. Please stand up. <laughs> so anyway, I guess for me, the experience that, I'm, that I've told you about is like you have to come to terms with yourself. You have to love yourself so you can appreciate those things in others. If you heal yourself, you can heal others. And I think if you take time to look inside and find that little boy, that little girl inside yourself, then you treat them well, and then you're ready to look, see a little boy, a little girl next to you that may need some help. Because if you do that, it's just the greatest feeling in the world. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.